questions for any of the panelists? So can we talk a little bit about like the engagement between the communities that you're covering and the people who are covering them and sort of what some of the nuances are? Um, just to sort of politely point out, we have an all white cast here and we're covering a very racially charged issue. And so how did you each handle that within your newsrooms and within your coverage and who you were showcasing and who you were talking to and what sort of voices you gave the most leverage to? Uh, on the editorial page, one of the things we did that, that uh, we don't do enough of is we, well, partly because we, we no longer have an op-ed editor who actually goes out to seek op-eds. Um, and so we're, we're in very much of a, you know, hey, if you send us an op-ed, we'll, we'll, we'll consider it amongst the many that we receive. During Ferguson, I spent a lot of my time actually seeking specific op-eds from specific audiences. So knowing uh, our... Uh, whiteness on our editorial board. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, seeking out uh, African Americans and other people of color to specifically talk about Ferguson uh, and get them on our op-ed page. So we were much more active in terms of the voices that we sought for our page. And then uh, a variety of different times during, particularly from like August through December, um, we would give up our whole page to uh, either letters or, or op-eds because we got such a high volume of, of information from readers. Uh, I can't speak to the, the, the newsroom per se. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I mean, on the editorial board, we're, we're aware of our, of our deficiencies and wish we could do something about it and would like to, if somebody ever lets us hire. Um, but, but it was, I mean, it was very much a part of the problem and uh, a part of the story. And it's something that we were very cognizant of the fact that while we were criticizing uh, police departments for not having enough people of color, that we don't have enough people of color. I mean, I know we were uh, on the editorial board, we were cognizant of it. Um, it was part of the social media conversation for sure. I mean, we, 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 we took the occasional shot from folks in the community who know that our primary three writers on the editorial board are white. This was a, a story that was really unpopular in St. Louis, and, and I think a lot of our readers just wish it would go away, uh, unlike covering a lot of stories. Uh, you know, uh, this is not a Cardinals championship. It's, it's not even, um, you know, a lot of the coverage, we look for uh, villains, right? And a lot of people were jumping on who's the villain in this story. And um, I think earlier Rami had said something about, you know, if, if the user generated content tells the story properly, then let it be told that way. And this was a case where every user came at it with a different opinion uh, and including uh, newsroom folks. And, um, you know, I, I could point to some check boxes, you know, the, the person who uh, is the A1 editor every day is African American. We had African American reporters, we had Afro -Amer American photographer, uh, African American video editor, but it, it wasn't enough and it didn't reflect the community and it's the same thing that we're calling uh, community leader leadership out on. But I think what is important is that you have a staff of people that are trained to do the stuff that they trained you here when we went to this journalism school, it wasn't about software development or things like that. It was about asking questions and being a good listener and being a good observer. So as, as this uh, storytelling changes from just print to these doing these nonlinear displays, I think looking at the, the, the makeup of the newsroom and who they are is going to be very important. But who they are, their, their skin color, uh, their background, their racial background is important, and there's a whole lot of other things that would go into it as well. One last part I'd, on that. I'd, I'd also like to answer your question when oh. you're finished. Thanks. Uh, we had a, a constant presence uh, in Ferguson, and so and regardless of the color of the skin of the reporter or photographer, you know, we were on first name basis with a lot of people out there. And when times got a little heated, that relationship, you know, you know, was you know, made, kept us safe at times, and it got us stories that 
you know, other times. Uh, so uh, that's that was one of the things. The other thing we've done is there's been a lot of panels, discussions in St. Louis. Uh, you know, St. Louis has had some. I've been a part of several uh, at local colleges and uh, Missouri History Museum is a big you know place that's been having those as well. We've been a part of that at schools. We've done a lot of things within schools. So, yeah, we're we're aware of that, and so we're you know trying to reach out. Uh, first of all, thank you for asking those questions. They need to be asked. Um, the observation you made about the composer of this panel also needed to be said. Um, this story flat out did spark conversations about race in our newsroom. Uh, like Tony was saying, um, it's, you know, we have several staffers of color, but it's not enough. Um, we are actively making changes to try to correct that. Um, and we have at St. Louis Public Radio um, a race and culture fellow named Emmanuel Berry. And um, though she was already partly way through her fellowship, it became very clear that this would be the primary story on which she would work. However, it's very important, and it's my personal opinion, that race coverage should not be siloed off into a fellowship. It should be in every single beat, and it should not just be interview a person of color because of the fact that they are a person of color about racial issues. It should be because they are a doctor. It should be because they are a lawyer. It should be because they have interests. All of that said, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. And I'll just briefly add um, that by using the game mechanics that I described, it, I think it all lies in the user testing. And so what I've already done is conduct a number of sessions with community members from Ferguson um, and given them the experience and then ask for their feedback. And my goal, my hope is that come um, the anniversary, we're actually going to roll out a um, more accessible version using Google Cardboard rather than you know a state-of-the-art PC and a $350 headset so that community, community members can try it and experience it from different viewpoints. I think it's... Um, the, the issue you raised is obviously completely um, conspicuous, as is the fact that access to this technology often is as well. And in a room like this, the demographics are very, very similar. So I think we need to look around ourselves and see, you know, it's amazing what we're doing, but how can we incorporate other voices in the creation of this sort of technology? Okay, and this is the last question here. Hi, um, I work at a media outlet in Kansas City, and so I certainly appreciate and applaud everything that you did to cover cover Ferguson, um, having watched it in the same state, but from afar. I guess I had kind of two questions. The, the first one is, you know, seeing that front page, that Sunday front page where there's a body while it's covered, covered. usually legacy media outlets are very loath to, to, to run something like that. I was curious about the conversation that led to such a, such a photo being published. And then along those lines, on, on our Facebook page, social media, there would be incredibly incendiary, racist, graphic, gruesome photos and comments made. How did y'all handle such, such things on your social media feed, particularly your Facebook page? Because I can only imagine what we were dealing with, what it was like in St. Louis. I'll, I'll do the comments and I'll let Linda do A1. Uh, it's, it's a difficult job to stay on top of, isn't it? And uh, I would say it, it really is. And um, you just walk the fine line of when do you shut off all the conversation. Um, Tony has done that on the editorial page uh, sort of as an experiment, but um, it, was just, it was just a lot of monitoring and sometimes it's engagement on the page. If really you just walk across the room and let people know you're there in uh, the comments, that helps a lot. Um, but you're right, I, I don't have a magic answer other than just let people know that you're there, use the ban button very liberally. Um, I'd say we banned a lot more users uh, from the commenting uh, through that period than we had at any other time. Tony can talk about it. Absolutely. The interesting thing we did on the editorial page, which is, you know, it seems contradictory to this idea that we were trying to seek more engagement through our partnership with the Guardian and everything, but we we cut off all comments on all editorial comment letters, editors or editorials and, and columns. Um, and we did it because we wanted to be part of a solution and the, the, the information on those types of comments, 
I found to be fairly toxic. It was a complicated situation because I'm not in charge of that policy for the company. Uh, and so I had to work with, with Bob and with our editor and with our publisher to say, I want to do this. I think it's important. I think it will allow us to have a, a higher level conversation in other places. And we've continued that. We still don't have, uh, I don't know how long we're going to do it, but we still don't have comments on the editorial part of, of, of our desktop, of our website right now. We do in the other parts in the news pages. And so the, the, the other side of that, the responsibility side, is you then have to be able to engage on Twitter and Facebook and uh, other places in terms of trying to increase your level of conversation if you're going to sort of be true to that idea. If you're doing it just because you don't want to deal with it, that's one thing. But we did it because we just didn't want that level of conversation to drag down what we think are important discussions about uh, solving real problems in St. Louis. Yeah, and for me, um, that's, that's my primary job, um, is looking at all of the uh, commentary that's made. Um, other days was much more constructive than others. Um, and uh, very basically, you know, uh, we removed what what uh, went, a, went against our discussion policy, which we posted many, many times over, hate speech, threats, things like that, um, and, you know, made dis uh, decisions, you know, based on, hey, this is, uh, we had a lot of conversations about, hey, is this something that we need to let someone share or not? Um, but it, that was more on our Facebook page. Um, on our website comments, uh, they became um, so numerous uh, than what we were used to managing, what I was used to managing, I'll just cut right to the chase, what I was used to managing, um, and were generally unproductive discussions, no matter what people's name, you know, perspectives were. Um, and the volume combined with the nature of the comments uh, made it something that uh, I had to focus my attention elsewhere. And this is where, uh, if I had eight of me, <laughs> I'd love to put an entire staff on moderating a, 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 especially in this big of a story, on moderating a fruitful comment section. Um, but that's, that's one regret that I have ab about this, but it was no nothing could be done really about it, staffing wise. I saw a few instances on the social media promotion of the site, but on the site itself, there wasn't actually, it wasn't an issue. So. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the, the picture, uh, so that picture is from Tiffany Mitchell. She was uh, someone who lived there in Canfield. And there was a discussion, and it's, uh, it is certainly not anything you'd ever do lightly. Uh, when the Boston Marathon bombing happened, we had a picture on the front page that would be considered similar, maybe in graphic. In 2010, we sent a photographer to Haiti when the earthquake killed thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, we had a picture on our front page that would be you know, showing dead bodies. And other than that, I tried to find the last time we did this. I think it's been about a decade. And that shows you the magnitude, what this is, and, and how unique this is. If, and if it's been a 10 years and we published the paper every single day for a year, we've never done it with a local person. It shows you the significance of that. And I, my personal belief is that those four and a half hours is why we're here today discussing Ferguson. Uh, without that, it would be any of the stories that we're hearing that come and go. Uh, those four and a half hours set it apart, and therefore that picture has a certain unique uh, relevance, and that's why we used it. Uh, many readers hated it, and we do not do something like that lightly or expect to get off like without commentary on that. Yeah. Okay, and we're gonna have to make that the final word. So thank you very much, the panel from St. Louis. Thank you.